Well, hi there, Sax Gourmet fans. It's Steve Goodson. Uh, you don't know who I am. Just ask your old mama. She remembers me. But anyway, um, once again, I am speaking to you on uh, a Tuesday night. We have these seminars every other Tuesday night. From Sax Gourmet World Headquarters, uh, located here in the historic garden district of old New Orleans. Uh, we're located in Sector R. Now, listen. Uh, to no oh, good brother Emil Hall is <laughs> Pooney. I, I, I got so much good to say about him. I love Emil, and he knows it. And good brother Chad Taylor. But anyway, uh, listen. I know that tonight things look a little different, and the reason things look a little different is uh, full disclosure. I've had a little bit of a health issue last few days, so um, I am speaking to you from the executive apartments uh, here at Saxco May World Headquarters, but that is not going to prevent me in any way from discussing one of my very favorite topics, which is the decline and fall of the vintage saxophone market, and uh, since you guys know that uh, I love alternate titles. The alternate title for tonight's event is uh, you guys are really a lot bigger suckers than I ever thought possible. Um, now, let, let's, let me tell you, we announced this topic uh, uh, yeah, well, a few days back, and I have gotten more advanced uh, correspondence about this than anything else that we have ever talked about. Yeah, Chad, I, I'm, I'm doing fine. We can discuss this later, but I, really, I'm doing fine. Uh, but I am going to take the rest of the week off. Now, uh, here, here's the deal. Uh, let, let's get some things out of the way uh, with regard to definitions and full disclosure uh, before we uh, delve into this topic of... Uh, saxophones and new saxophones and used saxophones and all that. Okay. Uh, number one, full disclosure, uh, old saxophones. Uh, who's got more old saxophones than me? Well, uh, probably my good friend, uh, Professor Paul Cohen, <laughs> and he got cooler ones too. Uh, but, uh, I have a personal collection that I think current count is 156 individual horns. Uh, some of them from the, there's one that I think is from the 1880s. Uh, and then we have other horns that are I mean, just all different kind of stuff. Because I love saxophones. Now, um, that being said... People say, well, yeah, there are a lot of collectors. Listen, I can count pretty much on one hand or maybe both hands, but can't go much further than that, of people who have real serious collections and are serious collectors. Uh, uh, Dr. Cohen, and, and then there's, there's other people around. Sure there are. Uh, but uh, this business about, oh, there's this huge group of collectors who are bidding prices up and all that good stuff, that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, is a myth. Did you hear me? It ain't true. Uh, and I've been buying and selling saxophones uh, since right after the earth cooled. And believe me, if there was a whole bunch of people out there that were collecting saxophones, they would have my complete attention. Now, there are some, and every now and then something cool uh, passes through my hands, and it does make it way onto some of them. And as you know, at one time, 15 years ago, probably further than that now, uh, we used to be a very, very, very big vintage saxophone player. Now, let's talk about uh, the difference in vintage saxophones and used saxophones and old saxophones. Well, uh, the difference between vintage saxophones 
and old saxophones to used saxophones, it's usually, you know, a couple thousand bucks, sometimes more. Other than that, there ain't really a whole hell of a lot of difference. Did you hear me? There's Casey Ray Lipe. And Casey Ray, I want you to know that uh, those fellas you arranged to work for me couldn't have worked out better. Thank you. I love you for that. But now, the fact of the matter is, don't let yourself be fooled into saying, oh, it's a vintage horn and it's worth. Are you kidding me? Now, granted, some of them are worth a lot of money. Why? Because a horn's worth what a willing buyer and a willing seller can agree upon. But the fact of the matter is that most of you buyers are uninformed and are vastly, vastly overpaying for these horns. Now, let's, let's clearly understand one another about this. Just because something is old does not mean that it is valuable. Hear me? Uh, let's use an example of a couple of common saxophones. Uh, Bisher True Tones. Uh, they must have made a million of them uh, in the 20s and the very early 30s. Now, granted, if you got one in pink gold, heavily engraved, with white goatskin pads, and by the way, I did once own such a horn, you may have something that somebody give you some money for. Uh, failing that, if you've got a satin silver or even a bright silver, true tone alto, it ain't worth nothing. Why? Because they're common, 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 common. There's a bunch of them. And who wants them? Well, uh, now I, I'll, full disclosure, I got a couple of them somewhere. But here's the deal. Um, if you buy one of those for... A hundred dollars, um, and then you got to pay somebody a thousand dollars to properly repad it. Uh, and I'm talking about someone knows what they're doing, uh, not these. Yeah, I'll repad your home four hundred dollar guys, but a, a real bona fide repairman who can do it right. Then here you are with eleven hundred dollars in a horn that's worth. Two or three hundred dollars at best on a sunny day. Uh, because understand this you could take that same three hundred dollars and you can buy all sorts of high quality used horns of uh, somewhat modern manufacture. Um, or you can buy, you know, now you got to pay attention when you're doing this, but. Uh, you can buy some brand new horns for a little more than that. Um, and really, some of those $300 horns, while um, maybe not the most durable in the world, um, you know, they're not worth the cost of a repad, but they pay, play pretty good. And you need to understand that clearly. And... If you're trying to sell horns, you need to understand that even more clearly. All right, now, let's understand some things about the changing in nature of the saxophone market over the last hundred years. Up until um, World War I, saxophones were, now, while not a rarity, were not super common. Uh, there, there were plenty of them floating around. But then, after World War I ended, suddenly we had what a, my good buddy Bob Tedrow used to call that big saxophone scare of uh, the 1920s when every home in America seemingly had an uh, upright piano and uh, a saxophone. And you could uh, look over the piano player's shoulder and read along on the sheet music and play along. And consequently... Hundreds of thousands of saxophones were manufactured in the United States. And, of course, they were making them in uh, Europe at the time, too. Uh, but here we need to understand something. 
very, very clearly. If you keep it oiled and do just a little bit of maintenance every now and then, a saxophone can easily last 100 years. They don't wear out. They're also somewhat robust instruments uh, in, in that really it's, uh, it's kind of hard to damage one. Uh, you know, it can be done, uh, but they, they, they last a long time. So we have all of these saxophones, saxophone, saxophone, saxophones, saxophone, saxophone, saxophones. And they made more and more and more of them, more and more people learned to play. And then, following World War II, suddenly there was an interest because we had all these babies being born to these returning servicemen and all that. Suddenly, we had a situation where there was a bigger demand for school music. Now, here's something you need to understand. Uh, the school music business was heavily promoted by who else, the instrument manufacturers. Uh, but, you know, it was a good thing. And so many of us, including moi, uh, learned to play in uh, public school music programs and are better off for it. Okay, so all of this ends up meaning that there is a more than ample supply of used saxophones in the marketplace today. That being said, uh, never once did I contend that, well, after all these used saxophones became available or began existence, that suddenly all the factories shut down because they didn't. They kept making saxophones and saxophones and saxophones and saxophones. And then in the late 80s, this began and really caught on in the 90s, and I was yeah, guilty as charged. I played a large part in uh, making this happen. Suddenly, our good friends in Asia began turning out some extremely high-quality instruments at very low prices, as well, full disclosure, as some absolute crap. But they learned that people, you know, wouldn't buy the crap. And so the Asian instruments got better and better and better and better. And their cost of production got lower and lower and lower and lower. And so what happened was we had just a lot of saxophones on the market. And then along in the 90s comes this business called the internet and uh, full disclosure I've been running my business uh, on the internet almost exclusively since 1995 well around that time somewhere there came to be this thing called eBay and suddenly all these horns that were under beds and in closets and God knows where uh, went up on eBay uh, and people, frankly, in the early days of this, uh, most of the sellers, not all, but most, didn't have a clue what they had. And you could occasionally get some real bargains uh, relative to what people would ultimately pay for this stuff. Now, then there also got to be this situation going on. There was... And I credit this guy, who, who was a wonderful man, a guy named Gary Ray. Gary owned a, a store in uh, Wichita, Kansas, called Wichita Band Instrument Company. And Gary started running some very nicely uh, designed advertisements in this little magazine called the Saxophone Journal. And so um, what happened was, uh, David, we're going to talk about that Mexican disaster because I had a, well, I wasn't involved in that while it was going on, but I'm quite familiar with that. Um, but anyway, what happened was that uh, Gary started 
explaining to people what some of these older horns were and how they were different and what was cool about some of them. And I got to admit, there have been some fairly cool saxophones made in the past. Uh, the LeBlanc system horns come to mind. The Con 30Ms and 26Ms come to mind. Uh, the Holton Rudy Weedoft model comes to mind. Um, you know, here's some places where people wanted to actually advance the technology. They weren't just looking over their shoulder and seeing what the factory next door was building and then building more of that. And boy, was there a lot of that going on. Now, so we got plenty of saxophones on the market. And also, I think we can safely say that the vast majority of them, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are very, very, very similar to one another. What is the difference in a uh, Con U1 to 2 and a Bisher True Tone? Well, there's some differences, sure, but not a lot of differences. And don't you tell me there is, because I know better. All right, now, so here we got people beginning to make a little noise and, and say, uh, yeah, here's this horn. This Con 30M is cool. This Buffet S1 is cool uh, and all that. You don't see many of these. And a market begins to develop. And the market kind of feeds on its own momentum to a degree and it gets a little bigger and a little bigger. And unfortunately, every small town repairman and every pawn shop owner and every 13 year old down in his mama's basement who has grandpa's saxophone is, um, yeah, there on eBay. And suddenly they're a saxophone expert. Did you know that? They're a saxophone expert, and they're telling you all this stuff about saxophones that's, uh, I'm going to say most of it was due to ignorance rather than to uh, chicanery, but it's true. All right, so this market begins to develop for what people are claiming to be vintage horns. Now, let me ask you something. Uh, vintage horns? Really? Now, I'll grant you that a Busher uh, 400 top hat and cane, that's a vintage horn. Uh, I'll grant you that a um, Buffet Powell is a vintage horn, uh, etc. But most of this stuff is kind of like everything else. And then you find some horns from some European manufacturers, uh, particularly, but not exclusively, the uh, Selma Company, uh, who were making some kind of dandy saxophones. But there are guys out there that'll say, well, you know, uh, yeah, they're, they're sell this Selma uh, new large bore, uh, it's much superior to a con, uh, yeah, a con you wonder too. Is it really? You want to explain to me in uh, terms I can understand uh, the differences? I'm listening. Now, granted, when Selma uh, saw fit to introduce the balanced action model in the uh, mid-30s, now that was a game changer. There was an almost modern saxophone. Um, but, you know, before that, and, and I've owned multiple examples of all these. Yeah, those were pretty good horns. They were relative to other things that were on the market at the time. But, you know, does a Selmer Model 26 play better than uh, an equivalent Martin Handcraft of the era? I don't think so. I really don't. Okay, now, here's something else that you, uh, you guys need to understand. And if you think this isn't true, I want you to raise your hand, okay? Let's say we're going to buy an automobile to drive to work, okay? Do we want to buy uh, 
1931 Ford Model A. Good car at the time. Uh, or do we want to buy a, um, I don't know, an Infinity or a Toyota Camry or whatever? Oh, let's see. We're talking about apples and oranges, aren't we? Why? Because in the 50 years or so that went by or more, we learned more things about building automobiles and they got better and they got better and they got better. Well, in saxophones, we learned a lot about acoustics. We learned an awful lot about ergonomics. We learned a fairly significant amount about construction techniques. And I'm here to tell you, now, once again, I'm a guy that owns over 150 old homes, okay? And at one time or another, I have owned at least one example of anything reasonable you can ever come up with. But uh, is that better than uh, horns you can buy today? And I'm not just talking about Saks Gourmet horns, although there's nothing better and you know it. But, you know, than uh, Yonagasawa's, modern Selmer's. Yamahas, uh, and, and then there are a number of other Asian horns that are of very high quality. Um, but the fact of the matter is, automobiles got better over time, and um, so, so, so did saxophones. And I'm going to tell you something. For these guys that tell me that, well, you know, Steve, nothing sounds better than an old horn. Well, then you need to clean out your ears. Did you hear me? Because there's nothing about that old horn, sound-wise, acoustic-wise, that can't be absolutely duplicated should you care to do so. Did you hear me? You can duplicate the alloy, absolutely. You can measure the bore and the neck angle and all that, absolutely, and you can duplicate every bit of that. There's one thing that I don't think you can uh, absolutely duplicate on old horns, and uh, I, I did a whole seminar on this a few months back, but I'll, I'll just mention this. I truly believe that a saxophone gets better with age to a degree. Why? because the horn starts resonating at a given range of frequencies, and over time, it frees up. So if you don't want to wait 10 or 20 years for your horn to break in, just like your favorite pair of shoes broke in, then there is another way. What's that way? Cryogenic treatment. And don't tell me, well, it can't possibly work. You know, I, I, I read on Saks on the web that, oh, it can't, it can't. Well, let me tell you something. I have had well over 100 horns cryoed. I know the difference. Why? Because I've done it. Till you've done it, don't talk about it. Because you don't know. And you don't know the science behind it. So don't give me that crap. Really. I, I ain't buying Okay, now, I think we've gotten this situation all defined and all of that. And, and by the way, uh, don't you guys hesitate to like this seminar. And uh, you go ahead and hit that like button. I love to see those little blue thumbs go across the screen. And uh, be, feel free to share it on your web page or your girlfriend's web page or... Uh, you know, any groups that you uh, participate in, um, you you go right ahead. Um, we've already got a real good crowd tonight, and I appreciate that. So now, let's talk about, since we were going to talk about the decline and fall of the marketplace, which means we're talking about economics here, one of my favorite topics. Let's talk about the three different groups that buy saxophones and try to get a handle on who they are, what their needs are, and what their buying propensities. I love that word, propensities. Uh, propensities are. And there are players and students. And, and, and those groups 
the, or the, those two groups, players and students, they're, they have a lot of common characteristics, so we're going to treat them like one group. Uh, okay. Uh, the players and the students always want a quality instrument, and they always want a good price. They always have some specific musical goals, whether it's uh, making first chair in a junior high school band or, you know, going and uh, making a lot of money playing in them hockey tonks and bars. Um, now, they are usually, they don't have a lot of financial resources, typically. I tell people all the time, they say, you know, well, how many professional uh, players buy your Category 5 saxophones at $18,500, an example? Hell, I'd go broke uh, if I had to count on professional players to buy those things. Why? They ain't got any money. Most of them don't. Okay, so when it comes down to participating in the marketplace, players and students are generally the first ones to fold and say, uh, I can't stand the action. That, that's too expensive. Um, you know, once the bidding starts, they out. Uh, hello, Bubba Harding. Uh, and so they're the most susceptible also to uh, myths and legends, you know, all that stuff about uh, Selmers being made from artillery shells, uh, you know that's true. Who told you that? The Tooth Fairy? Maybe it was Sasquatch. Maybe it was Easter Bunny. You know, but just stuff like that. Oh, Charlie Parker owned a Grafton saxophone. He borrowed one one time, but he never owned one. Uh, of course, uh, you know, there's all kind of myths. and The, the, the more naked the, the, the lady is on the bell, the be better the horn is. It goes on and on. And these guys, the, the students and the pro players, are usually the first ones to drink the Kool-Aid when they're told to do so. Uh, they're always looking for that magic bullet um, that's going to let them play uh, without working on their scales some more, uh, you know playing intervals and all that. They're not significant at all in uh, establishing prices in a marketplace. They just kind of go with the flow. Um, they also tend to believe that every uh, Mark VI tenor that's been re-lacquered three times and the engraving's all worn down smooth and the pearl, the key touch pearls are all worn down, have grooves in them. It's worth at least $10,000. And they'll say, well, yeah, they're getting that up in New York City. Hell, did you see what they're getting for them on eBay? Let me tell you something, dumbass. They ain't getting that for them. They're asking that, but they ain't necessarily changing hands for that. And here's something you need to understand when you're buying a saxophone uh, from me or any other dealer. The fact of the matter is, I'm going to ask as much as I can possibly get because the profit I make on saxophones is how I feed me and my wife and my, my dogs and, uh, you know, everybody else, okay? Uh, if you don't want to pay the price I'm asking, make me another offer and show me some $100 bills, and then maybe we got something to talk about, okay? But don't tell me that all of these worn-out horns are, are, are bringing $15,000 or there's $10,000 10 M's out there and all that kind of stuff. Now, I don't want you guys to think for a minute that I've got it in for all the vintage horn dealers because some of them are very good friends of mine, very good friends of mine, been guests in my home and are welcome to be guests again. Now, that being said, and, and, and I'll tell you something else. As many people verify, I refer a lot. You know, people say, I've got this horn I want to sell and all that. Who, who should, do you want to buy it? No, I'm not in that business anymore. Uh, but I want you to call uh, my good friend Mark Overton up at uh, Sax Quest. Uh, I've dealt with Mark for years. He's a very ethical guy, good guy, very knowledgeable, and will treat you fair. Now, 
There's some other dealers out there uh, that are good people and all that. Of course, they ain't ever sent me a damn bit of business. So, uh, consequently, after a while, I ain't going to send them any business. That's what makes the world go round. Got it? Okay. All right. So, uh, anyway, these uh, players and students are often kind of naive about uh, prices, condition, and all that. That's why we publish our guide to vintage uh, saxophone values, which you can find on saxgourmet.com. Now, let's talk about another group, the true collectors. And remember, I said earlier in this program that uh, I can count them on one hand, maybe two hands, are the people that have significant collections that I know who are serious about it and knowledgeable about it. Now, there are very, 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 very few of them, and they are very knowledgeable, they're very obsessive, and they are extraordinarily, extraordinarily careful. And I want to use uh, my good friend, Professor Paul Cohen, as an example. I don't know anybody that I consider more knowledgeable than Dr. Cohen. Uh, he's also very careful. He's very careful. Uh, and, you know, he is always going to be fully informed on anything he's buying for his personal stash. Uh, he watches the market and he knows what's going on. Now, I watch the market. I'm not particularly interested in adding anything uh, to my personal collection unless you've got an original LeBlanc Le Rationale. I'd like to talk to you about that. Uh, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is uh, that I watch the market because we publish a value guide. And I'm interested in this. I've been watching it for years. But the collectors that I know are never going to overpay for a horn. And they don't have much sway in the marketplace because they're not that many of them. They're not that many of them. Um, you know, like I said, I'm going to use my friend Dr. Cohen again. Dr. Cohen is a great influence on me and my love for the saxophone. But Dr. Cohen doesn't really set prices, except maybe at the extreme upper stratosphere of the market on those incredibly rare things that we all want. But you know, for, for your average 10M or, you know, a, a Selmer balanced action, nah, he's not a factor there. You know, Buffet Powell, yeah, he's right in there. Um, now, understand that these collectors are highly informed. And they don't mind paying top dollar at all for pristine examples. And they know the very definition of the word pristine, and they know the very definition of the word original, and you're not going to fool them. Now, there's one other group that we got to talk about, and that's the speculators. And speculators are the guys who say, well, I'm going to buy up all, all the Con 12M berries I'm going to lay my hands on. I don't care how beat up they were in school music programs, uh, because, you see... <laughs> Uh, they're going to be worth more. They're, they're just going to be worth more. We all know that. Uh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, not just the 12M example. But these guys are behind some of the ridiculous asking prices. Not selling prices, but asking prices. Uh, but, and, and, you know, they'll, they'll go on there and, I want $12,000 for this three-time relacquered Mark VI. Okay, good for you. And then after you've looked at it every day for six, eight months and hadn't had a single serious offer, then, huh, guess what? Suddenly that becomes an $8,000 horn, then it becomes $6,000 horn, et cetera, et cetera. And remember, every day, more and more horns come out from under beds and out of closets, and the pawn shops have got them, and... They're all over eBay and Reverb.com and um, Craigslist. That's new. So suddenly, this stuff's all a lot more available. 
And consider this, if you will, my friends, it's a worldwide market now. That wasn't the case when I first got in the saxophone selling business 30 years ago. The fact of the matter is, is that my company now, we just sell new instruments now, okay? That's the only business I'm in. And, and accessories, not. But about 65% of my business is outside of the United States. And I talk to these, quote, uh, vintage slash used slash old horn dealers all the time, and I think a good many of them have similar experience. It's a worldwide market, so you better pay attention to the fact that that guy in Germany may want that uh, gold-plated Mark Seven, uh, and all that. But the saxophone market is not radically different than any other market. In, in, in that it, it really gets down to supply and demand, and supply is going up. And the supply, you know, this stuff doesn't wear out. It generally doesn't. Horns that were sold 60, 70 years ago, are those same horns still being resold today. That's not true with automobiles. They wear out. Um, but saxophones, no, that's not the case. Uh, also, you need to also understand this. Um, this may come as news to you, but the demand for saxophones, as far as uh, all we can really track easily is new instrument sales, it's down. I'm not talking about for my company. Our sales are actually up. But, uh, you know, overall market is down about 40% from where it was 10 years ago, even though... Prices are generally a lot lower. So uh, suddenly, huh, it's a whole different world. And uh, if you're sitting there on a whole bunch of the equivalent of last year's bathing suits that you're trying to sell, uh, some of these vintage horns, that suddenly everybody got their tuner out and said, well, uh, listen, those old Mark Sixes are cool, and they do feel sexy under the hands. But the simple fact of the matter is the damn things don't play in tune on the palm keys and the, and the bell keys always sharp. Um, now, these uh, small town repairmen are all going to try to tell you there's nothing sound like an old horn and all you got to do is pay me a couple of thousand dollars and I'll fix this one up for you and you'll have nothing like it. Now, what you'll have is a lot less $100 bills in your old wallet and that small town repairman who probably didn't know what he was talking about in the first place. I mean, where where these guys suddenly get to be experts? Uh, you you know you know what you sell two or three horns a year, and you an expert? Are you kidding? When you start selling two or three a week, then let's talk. But as long as you selling two or three a year, you don't know what the hell you are doing. So um, anything else? Uh, the prices were initially driven up by globalization because our good friends in Japan went into a feeding frenzy and started buying stuff uh, and paying too much and buying stuff. And now uh, they can't give that stuff away. They can't. They can't. They can't. But another thing that's gone up uh, because, yes, I did go to fancy business school rather than taking a degree or two in music when I was in college. But uh, if you watch international currency markets, you don't see those wild fluctuations like there used to be. So uh, the U.S. price of horns, and that's still where most of the horns actually, actually live, there's not necessarily a, a big price advantage to a, a buyer in the U.K., you got to watch that. Yeah, you can make money working off currency spread. I've sure done it many times, but most people don't do that. So the upward movement in prices was initially uh, brought about by the speculators primarily. Wasn't the players and the students, they didn't have any money. There weren't enough collectors to significantly influence the market. It was the speculators that are people who fancied themselves speculators and that's what most of them did. They just said they were, you know, oh, yeah, I'm a big-time dealer and all that. How many horns you got? I got eight. 
Really? You got eight? Are you kidding me? But anyway, uh, these guys watch prices go up and go up, and because one speculator fed off another, and before long, they all got caught with their britches down, and it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of folks. Um, so anyway, the collectors will always pay more than musicians and usually have the resources to do so. And the speculators will invariably pay more than the collectors. Uh, saxophones are, for the most part, a luxury good. Now, true, I made a handsome living playing a saxophone for many years, so it was a tool of um, tool of a trade. Uh, you, you know, just like a carpenter's got to have a hammer. Well, I had to have a baritone sax and a tenor and all that. Uh, <coughs> but only a very small part of the market has really got to have a new saxophone. Very small. Um, it's a world market now, and so the bubble has burst. People are getting smarter all over the world. Um, you know, understand that the saxophone market is minuscule compared to, say, the guitar market. Or even the vintage key mark, keyboard mark. I'm wearing my, this is an original Moog t-shirt. Uh, and I sold a mini Moog a few years back that I'd been carrying around for years. And sold it for what I thought was stupid money. And then I get to looking at what people pay for original ones now. And I realize I'm the one that was stupid. But anyway, today customers have a lot more options you know, if, if you want to go play gigs and you need a tenor and your budget is uh, $1,000, just sit tight. You can buy a used, very clean Yamaha 62 for 1000 bucks. I bought them for a lot less than that many times. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to compete with such that. I mean, they're still making those horns. Um, you know, prices for top of the line, New instruments are actually lower when you adjust for inflation uh, than at any time in history, and they're much, much better. Modern instruments are more responsive. They play much more in tune. And I'm, I mean, for, I'm going to use our horns as an example because I'm familiar with them. You buy a Super 400 Series 2, and it comes new with two necks, two different, entirely different sounds. It is much more in tune than uh, any other saxophone you've been able to buy in the last 20 years. If you don't believe me, just try one, okay? And until you've actually tried one with a good tuner, shut up. Uh, but, you know, we're not the only ones making good saxophones. Uh, th there's some good stuff that you can uh, you can buy for not a lot of money. Um, and, phew. People are wising up. Will prices ever um, go back up? I don't think so because there isn't enough interest in the super rare saxophones. You know, uh, a gold-plated 30M or uh, a V Martin tenor with a solid silver neck. Now, uh, David wanted to know why are mouthpiece prices so high? What's high? 800 to 1,000 bucks? Uh, my company doesn't make a mouthpiece that costs that much. I, I think the most expensive mouthpiece we make is $650. Um, and, uh, I, I know there are some people selling brand new mouthpieces for more than that. I, I know that. Uh, but people paying, you know, ton of, well, I sold an original Gord Allen not too long ago for a ton of money. Why? Because somebody was willing to pay it. Um, I've got uh, a very rare original round chamber Selmer tenor in mint condition, and I want a ton of money for it. Huh. Why? They ain't making any more of them, and uh, I don't have to sell it. Uh, but, the, the yeah, the old double ring links, some of those are real nice. Some of the Gordon is real nice. 
Oh, good brother, Lauren Pickford's with us. Lauren bought a, a Bisher Aristocrat Alto from me about 20 plus years ago, and he's still using it. And that goes, to, and he plays it every night. So uh, that goes to show you, you can't wear him out. Uh, but it's good to have Lauren with us. He's a great player and a great guy. But anyway, yeah, yeah, that guy's paying a, a lot of money or asking a lot of money. Uh, and a couple of times recently, I've received a lot of money for something that's hard to find. But uh, are those mouthpieces worth it? Well, I think uh, those, um, I'd rather have one of our uh, Duke of New York. Well, that, that's what's on my horn right now is a Saxe uh uh, Duke of New York, so uh, yeah, I think that's a lot better than anything Dave Wardell ever made. Uh, you know, try one, see what you think. But there are a lot of good mouthpieces out there today, too. Uh, Eric Falcon's making some good mouthpieces. Uh, you know, Ted Clune's making some good mouthpieces, and they're not alone. There, there, there's some good stuff out there. So am I. I'm making good ones. So anyway, um, yeah, yeah, uh, if if you're looking to get rich, buying used saxophone, you know, collector quality saxophones and all that, you a fool. Go play the stock market. It's uh, it's doing fine right now, and uh, you can get a good good yield on some of these common stocks. So uh, that's what I'm saying. Will Grizzle, I'm honored you join us. I I hope you uh, watch the whole program. We're winding up now. If you have questions or you have comments, I'm always glad to hear about them. Um, I am going to be closed for the remainder of this week. We'll reopen Monday. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, I'm always glad to hear from you. So let me know what you think. So, uh, this is Steve Goodson, and I'm reminding you this. Practice long tones every day. Always keep your reed wet and Always, always, always play Sax Gourmet. Why? Because Sax Gourmet plays best, and you know it. So, that's it for the time being, boys and girls. Everybody have a great Independence Day, and uh, enjoy yourself. Goodbye for now.